Hi, and welcome to episode five of Off the Hill, the ANU's weekly look at what's been happening in the federal election campaign. As always, I'm joined by my colleagues, constitutional law expert Ryan Goss and political marketing expert Andrew Hughes. If you missed out any previous episodes, you can just go to anu.edu.au to catch up. And if you happen to be on tu- in Canberra on Tuesday nights, you can head along to our weekly public policy forums, The Vote. This week, we're talking about social policy. Again, all the details are on the website. Now, this week we've asked our Twitter followers and our Facebook friends what they think is the issue, the, the most important issue that we haven't discussed or haven't heard about yet in the election campaign. And I think what was really interesting is that we found on Twitter people have, uh, really want to hear about the environment and yeah. on Facebook people really want to hear about Indigenous issues, which is another issue that we'll set aside for now. Um, but let's, let's get stuck into these. What do you think, Andrew? Um, look, the environment's a great issue. I mean, it's so emotive too as an issue. And in years past, it's been a, a you know a decider in campaigns, um, particularly in places like Tasmania, where yeah, okay. you, you, you got to go with me on this one. Yeah, no, no, Tassie's fair. Yeah, I mean, but the thing about the images too, of are those sort of like emotive images we've seen in past campaigns. We cannot you know forget the Rivers campaign mm. in Tasmania. Um, old growth logging, of course, has been an issue not just in Tasmania but also in other states like Queensland, for example, New South Wales. And of course, Victoria. So you've got all these like emotive campaigns you can run on the environment and we're not seeing them. I mean, modern campaigns, for example, on public transport, on cycling, cycling is always a hot issue. Always a nice wedge issue, cycling. Um, love being a cyclist, by the way. So <laughs> I've got some issues on this. We'll go to Ryan first. Well, I think that's right. And what Andrew says is, is of course right. But the last 10 years, I suppose, have been the story of trying to take action on things like climate change, but reconcile that with a need, a perceived need to protect the economy and yeah. to ensure that jobs and growth, as the Prime Minister would say, aren't <laughs> compromised. And so Kevin Rudd said that's the great moral challenge of our mm. time. I think the mm. last 10 years, 10 years have shown that it's a great political challenge trying to mm particularly for the Labor Party, but also for the Liberal Party, to reconcile, on the one hand, taking action on climate change with um, letting people understand and realise that that may involve changes to our economy over the long term as well. And that's very hard for the parties to negotiate, it seems. There, there's a lot going on here, right? Because the images yeah. are so nice, as you say. You know, it's such a nice sort of positive thing to talk about the environment. But then as you've observed this week, Ryan, it's all being couched in jobs talk. Yeah, that's right. So I think the Labor Party um, has stuck to its guns on climate change in, in many senses. It's um, going to this election with an emissions trading scheme, but a more tailored, focused emissions trading scheme. Um, it's going to the election with schemes for the Great Barrier Reef and so on that are designed to appeal to people for whom the environment is a key issue. But mm. they're framed in terms of protecting jobs and providing opportunities for um, jobs and economic growth in renewable energies, for example. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm going to sort of throw my cynical hat in here. We know who we know for whom the environment is an important issue, and it's green voters. Yeah. So since 2008, we've we've asked 26,570 Australian voters what they think is the most important issue facing the country at that time. Right. So this is over, you know, seven years. Overwhelmingly, coalition voters always worried about the economy and jobs, which is exactly as we'd imagine. ALP voters split. They're they're more sort of, uh, I guess. Um, heterogeneous, you know, to use the academic sort of jargon. Uh, Greens voters, absolutely concentrated on the environment. Mm. Don't care that much about about the economy and jobs and and the big three, I call them, immigration, economy and better governance. But there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, green voters... There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not judging them. Exactly, and the Greens appeal appeal to the Greens, right? But, yeah, but thinking about it as a strategy of a political party, that they can't appeal for everything. Yep. They have to go after something where they can get their core behind them and get elected every single time they go up. So if they go too mainstream, they run the risk of diversifying too quickly. And all of a sudden you think, oh, Greens, but are they really Greens anymore? Yeah, absolutely. And it also reflects, I think, um, the Labor Party's slightly tricky position at this election of having to run defensive campaigns in inner Sydney, inner Melbourne, Mm. perhaps inner Brisbane to a lesser extent, um, against the Greens, while Mm. at the same time ensuring that Mm. they don't alienate voters on questions of... uh, carbon tax and emissions. Which leads yeah. us very nicely into Indigenous affairs because it's exactly the same problem. Exactly right, yeah. I mean, what, you think, where, where is the action? Where are the, um, where is the real measures we need to take as Australians, particularly white Australians? We need to do more on the reconciliation front. We need to make the steps. We need to say sorry. We need to make sure it's clear. We need to put the money behind the words. Mm. We need to put the action behind the words. Put the rhetoric aside. 
It should be bipartisan. Why isn't it bipartisan? <laughs> Why don't I ever feel bipartisan about this issue? Oh. Why don't I have that sense that all the parties should believe in this? Every political party in this country should believe in this. Because you're gloriously optimistic, Andrew. I am. I'm a marketer. Come on. <laughs> That's what we do. I, I will well, <coughs> back this up with some, with some yeah. nice evidence. Some, Please. Some, you know, also optimistic evidence. So we <laughs> asked people about this in 2014. 44% of Australians want more yeah. support for Indigenous communities. Uh, we overwhelmingly believe that it's it's a combination of factors yep. that have led to in, entrenched Indigenous in, in disadvantage. Yep. And only 19% uh, have said we've gone too far in supporting Indigenous communities. So there's yeah. something there. There's, there's appetite, I guess, for change. There certainly is. And... Um I think there is bipartisan support for notions like closing the gap. I think mm. what's missing perhaps is bipartisan support for the measures that really make a difference underneath those overarching umbrella labels. And I think for me as a constitutional um, law specialist, I think what comes to mind here is that we are expecting in the next term of the parliament a constitutional referendum on mm. recognising Australia's first peoples in the constitution. Will it get bipartisan support? And the question mm. is whether it will get bipartisan support. <laughs> yeah. At the moment, it's both parties are on board, um, huge polling majorities in favour of recognising the first Australians. The problem is no one knows what that will mean yet. There are multiple mm. competing yeah. versions of what that amendment could look like. And as soon as we have a proposal on the table, that will begin to cause divisions within the major political parties, within political discourse, potentially within Indigenous Australian communities. And there are people doing great writing on this at the moment. Megan Davis at UNSW mm. is doing some terrific yeah. work. Good and work. I think it's yet to enter the mainstream <clears throat> political discourse that this is actually really a contested debate in Indigenous mm. and non-Indigenous Australia. And it will be a really tricky issue to navigate potentially in the next term of parliament for the government. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then that's grim. We're optimistic and now we've... You've really pulled it down. But it's also <laughs> worth saying, of course, that, that constitutional recognition is and should only be part of the picture, that closing the gap is yeah. um, will be assisted by constitutional amendments, but yeah. but it's only part of the picture. Yeah, That's absolutely. Right. Yeah. Now, the minor parties are everywhere this week, all over the news. Xenophon's going to cause all kinds of trouble if he gets the balance of power. What, <laughs> why, why this campaign? What do oh, they do so well? On. Richard Branson, this is, this is what he's put himself onto. I mean, it's really similar <laughs> campaign strategy to what Richard Branson did, which was disruption, disruption, disruption. Nick Xenophon is the disruptor of Australian politics right now. Oh, this is, come these, on. Are, come these on. are just I know. random it, that, words, that's a Andrew. Scientist you speaking. <laughs> the market is going to go, no, shenanigans to that. Stop being so hard and scientific all the time. Live a little. Like, no, they have do that run life good campaign. They do run good campaign. And they do. And he's been disrupting South Australian politics for decades. This isn't, he's, he's not new it's, to this. He's, he's just taken it to the national stage. It's not just South Australia. I think way back in January, if we can, to when he put his candidate launch for Warringah, Tony Abbott's seat, right when it was dead in the media space, he had the entire airspace to himself at that time when he launched that candidate. Now, they're going to get wiped away in this election. There's no question at all they're going to have any chance in that seat. But what he did do was get our media, um, you know, attention and awareness on him and his campaign for that day at a really quiet spot of the year. Now, we come at this from different perspectives. Yeah. You think the you think Xenophon in particular is, is a mastermind Look, I'm not going to say he's the best I've seen, but he's definitely up there. And I, and I look, I, it's backed up by what his campaign's about too, like submarine cakes outside the front of Parliament House. Who could forget that? Everyone can forget that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course they can, but there's, <laughs> but there's stunts which get our attention and our attention's about getting awareness and that changes your perception of him. And all of a sudden you think this guy's got a lot more power behind him than what maybe he does. You're right, at the moment. True. He's one person in Parliament, one. Mm. But he certainly one. captured a lot of attention and engagement in South Australia. That, His polling numbers right. are incredible. Yeah, absolutely. And that's it. And that's what it matters in politics. You get that attention, awareness equals momentum. Momentum equals people get behind you. Perception seems like you've got to be more powerful than what you are. Let's get on this person because he's a winning team. He's a breath of fresh air compared to the two majors who become complacent and spin doctoring as we saw last Sunday night. Now, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. And this is the problem. Xenophon is able to leverage off... I think what we're, we're not picking up in opinion polls yet, but yeah. what is a really underlining uh, dissatisfaction with the two major parties? And I don't think people have worked out quite how to express that yet or yeah. how to put that into words. But I think yeah. the major parties in Australia have been really, really sloppy, really lazy, yeah. on the back foot, haven't really innovated in the way that we would have expected. Now I'm using the jargon, but uh, I think this is chickens coming home to roost for the majors. Yeah. And I think in 2013, what we talked about as being a kind of electoral anomaly was actually, maybe not in the case of Lionhelm, because there's good evidence to suggest that he benefited from being on that, you know, that number one spot, that donkey spot on the New South yeah. Wales Senate ballot. Yeah. But I think there is a genuine 
uh, a genuine interest in minor parties. And that's right. And I think it's worth emphasising that we did have these Senate voting reforms this, yep. that were passed earlier this year that High Court has signed off on. Um, they were really designed uh, to stop the micro parties swapping preferences behind yep. the scenes. But it, by no means at all does that mean that we should count out the minor parties. Mm, they weren't designed yeah. to do that. The Greens, the Xenophons, potentially the Pauline Hansons, the Glenn Lazarus, the Jackie Lambies. Uh, yep. There's every reason they'll do well out of this, particularly when we take into account the double dissolution and the fact that you need fewer votes yeah. to get into the, the Senate. The lower quota, time, I think, yeah. will hit harder than, yeah. than a lot of us are ready for. I, I And it was a lazy response. I think, mm. changing the laws in response yeah. to this threat from the minor parties. Now, final thoughts for the week. Final thoughts for the week. Um, Parliamentary Budget Office have been doing their work and uh, this week they revealed a blowout in one of the government's costings yep. on, on company tax rate, I think it was. So went from 48 to $51 billion. Huge numbers. $3 billion is a black hole of quite significance. So it raises the question, and it was raised during the week too, uh, at the Forum on the Economy, yep. um, about how we're doing our costings and how long-term they need to be. Yep. Uh, and the consensus there was on terms of the economy, it needs to be a lot further ahead. We need to have longer term costings. Introduce all kinds of error. But if you want more details on that, that's all on the ANU website from last uh, last week's policy forum. And Ryan? Uh, my thought for the week is <coughs> that we had the leaders debate last Sunday. It was, I think we can all agree, a pretty dreary <laughs> affair. Um, if, if, we, if we have future <laughs> debates or so-called debates, I think we need to take a leaf out of the Americans' book in how we ask the questions and take a leaf out of the Brits' books in terms yep. of who's on yeah. the stage and how they're organised. Yep, yep, get more up there. My thought is that uh, the ALP and Vote Compass and the ABC more generally are going toe-to-toe. -to -toe. It's a subject very <laughs> dear to my heart and I can't wait to see how it plays out. Really Thanks everyone for watching and we'll see you again next week.